seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Dick Brown of Rockford, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now Dick, can you start us off with some background and begin just uh, where and when were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, I, uh, I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I lived in Rockford. Uh, what year were you born? 1946, okay. in December. Mm -hmm. I lived in Rockford and I graduated from Rockford High School in 1965. At that point, people were being drafted left and right, mm -hmm. and uh, I, was, I, I wasn't a brilliant student or anything like that, so I just wanted to bum around and find myself mm -hmm. <laughs> for a year. Unfortunately, Uncle Sam found me before I found myself, and I got a draft notice in January. I went down there. Okay. Before we kind of get into that a little bit, uh, can you tell me, like, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Well, my dad worked in a factory, but we lived on a small farm, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, just north of Rockford, Michigan, uh, at in those days, Rockford was a real quaint little town, and uh, it's out in the country. And I, I wasn't, you know, I thought streetwise meant you always look both ways <laughs> before you cross the street. And I thought gay was happy-go-lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I was real naive. Yeah. Well, it was just a little farm town at that point. I mean, it's yes. a fairly developed suburb yeah. now of Grand yeah. Rapids, but, but then, sure then, then, then it wasn't. All right. And in that period there, now you're, you finish high school right at about the point when the Americans start to send people into Vietnam on yeah. a large scale. Now, in that kind of six months there between when you graduate from high school and when you get the draft notice, uh, were you paying any attention to, like, news about that or? No, not really. Uh, I do remember a conversation for some reason that sticks in my head between uh, at the supper table and the news was on and they was fighting in Vietnam and uh, my sister, uh, my younger sister said something really stupid about the war and my dad said, hey, pay attention, your brother may have to go. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and uh, I I didn't pay much attention to that or anything. Okay. And okay. But then you actually got you got a draft notice in the mail. Yes. And then what did you do after you got that? Well, I got the draft notice and uh, <laughs> I went and took my physical, and they told me I'd be probably getting sometime in April. I'd be drawn up. Well, I just went home and just waited. And then one day, I was going down to my older sister, who is married. I was going down there for a Sunday afternoon dinner. And on the way, I passed a billboard, and it was in two parts. One half showed this Marine uh, in a foxhole and bullets flying and, and stars, you know, really tough looking, mm -hmm. cripe sakes, uh, looked like John Wayne, mm -hmm. if you remember that. And then the other half of the billboard showed the same Marine in his dress blues driving a shiny blue convertible and there was a bunch of girls. <laughs> and, and, boy, I tell you, that's false advertising. I, the next day, I went down and enlisted okay. in the Marine Corps. <laughs> and you think back on it, no, that's really dumb, but that's what happened. 
<laughs> you were not, not the only guy to have been persuaded by, <laughs> by, by some of that image, especially at that point in time. <laughs> All right. So you go, you, you sign up. Now, when you're signing up, are they uh, giving you any offers about choosing a specialization or no. Uh, no. were there options about length of time you enlist for? Oh, yeah. Uh, the thing is, I had been drafted by the Army. Mm -hmm. That was two years. Yeah. I figured I could fill out my enlistment, and at the time, uh, the Marine Corps was having trouble getting enough men, mm -hmm. so they come up with a program where you could enlist for two years. Well, that was, uh, that was simple for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. So I enlisted for two years. Okay. And so then after you've, you've signed the enlistment papers and so forth, uh, at what point do they send you off for training? Well, I don't know. A uh, couple weeks, okay. I think. Uh, I went down to Detroit, and uh, shucks, there were several other guys from Grand Rapids mm -hmm. area. And uh, we had to take another physical, mm -hmm. which was real tough. You had to do five chin ups and five push ups. And I said, you're good enough, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, were the guys going through that physical, were some of them draftees, or do you not know? No. When I got to uh, basic, I learned that the uh, uh, platoon that went before me was made up of a lot of draftees. Mm -hmm. And then after, there was none in my platoon. Okay. But afterwards, I think when I got through training, uh, the Marine Corps was drafting a lot. Mm -hmm. And I talked to some of those guys, and they said the way they did it was uh, they made you all stand in line and count off. Every fifth guy was a Marine. Mm -hmm. So guys were quick changing places, <laughs> and some of them got caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you wanted to be a Marine. Oh, least, yes, I did. Speaking. I okay. did. All right. Now, where do they send you for training? Well, I went to San Diego. Hmm? Uh, all the Michigan guys went to San Diego. Uh, and that's where, too, the Wisconsin guys went to uh, Paris Island. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. They're for the rest of you. Right. All right. Yeah. When you go there, uh, do you fly a uh, commercial jet to San Diego? Or mm -hmm. do you remember how you got out there? Yeah, it was commercial. And then they uh, loaded us on buses. And that wasn't bad, but holy mackerel, when you got to the base, they drove us on buses and... Uh, a seven foot tall Tas Tasmanian <laughs> devil <laughs> yeah, gets on the bus and starts screaming. <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> Jumped off the bus. We all had to stand on the yellow footprints and <laughs> he just berated us something awful. Boy, oh boy, that time. Uh, Do you remember what time of day that was? Was that at night or during the day? Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know, maybe 7 o'clock mm -hmm. or something. It didn't get dark for an hour after mm -hmm. we was there. Okay. Man, oh man, we had to go through lines getting this, getting that, standing on the yellow footprints. And, <laughs> the, uh, and, and I remember going through lines for our first haircut. And... Uh, I was back, maybe 10, 15 guys, and uh, the DI says, well, when you get in your chair and you got a wart or a mole or something, you hold your hand up towards it so that the barber doesn't hit it. Well, I tell you what, I watched the guys in front of me, and they was holding it, and he went extra <laughs> blood just flying. So I got there. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, had you had any warning that this was what Marine Corps boot camp was like? No, I didn't. 
I didn't. I, I'd heard that, you know, Marines are really tough, and I figured the training would be real physical, mm -hmm. you know, and I was in fairly good shape. Well, it was physical, but uh, the worst part was the mental. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> just, just having somebody right in my face screaming at me, Holy mackerel, I never had that in Rockford. I mean, uh, I played football, and the coach was tough, all right, but he never got right in your face and just screamed at you and called you all kinds of names. And Oh, man, that was tough. That was tough. Then later in boot camp, uh, second or third day, going through it, uh, uh, they marched the whole platoon over and we had to sit through this class and they had a couple officers up there and uh, saying what the DIs could do to you and couldn't do to you. And uh, <laughs> afterwards, they marched our, our platoon right out back of the same building and unfortunately, I was right on the first squad, and the DI come right, talked right at me. He said, Private Brown, front and center. And I jumped up there and just, and he hit me right in the Adam's apple. <laughs> Choke. <coughs> they couldn't do that. <laughs> he did. So they went and did the things yeah. they said they couldn't do. <laughs> and he called me every name that they said they couldn't. He says, see, Private Brown, we can do those things, can't we? Yes, sir. You, I can't hear you. And he choked me a little more. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but that was, that was really rough. And I tell you, halfway through boot camp, I was ready to volunteer for Vietnam right then. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have to finish boot camp, I wanted to go right then. <laughs> I'd rather take my chance on getting shot than going through boot camp. <laughs> All right. now, do, what other kinds of things were, were they doing to sort of throw you off or play games with you? Well, <laughs> well. Another thing that happened, now, I knew better than this. I, I don't, I was told never, never volunteer for anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I was grasping at straws and the DI says, okay, I need a truck driver. Somebody want to be a truck driver. Oh, there's a, mm -hmm. I do, sir, or Private Brown, sir. You couldn't use pronouns. Mm -hmm. couldn't say mm -hmm. I or you or anything like that. I said, Private Brown, sir, would. He said, okay. And uh, he says, see that wheelbarrow over there? Bring it over here. I brought it over there, and he sat in it. He said, okay, truck driver, take me around base. So I got to show him where everything was. Mm -hmm. He showed me where everything was. My arms were about a foot longer before we got done. Oh, man. <laughs> Did going through that do you any good later? Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose uh, by the time I got through boot camp, if they were to give me a bucket of water and told me to charge hell and put out the fires, I think I could have done it. So you were learning what they wanted you to learn yes. anyway. Uh, yes. Now, the physical side of it, how easy or hard was that to adjust to? Oh, it wasn't really hard uh, uh, because, like I said, I was a football player, and I, I wasn't very far out of shape. Mm -hmm. and after I enlisted, I knew I was going in, so I got back in shape. Mm -hmm. But uh, all this bayonet training, uh, there 
if you didn't lose your head, you could really make some hay because mm -hmm. guys uh, get mad, you whack them a couple good times, and then they try and use that uh, thing like a baseball bat while you go to swing and somebody pops you right in the kisser with the butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and all the all the things. Uh, uh, for instance, we had uh, uh, go over this uh, uh, little pool of water, and there was a rope hanging halfway. Well, the first guy had to jump, grab the rope, and then swing back, and then drop over, and then he would release that thing, or the rope. Mm -hmm. And you had to, when the DI shoved you, you had to go and grab that rope and swing across. Well, if the guy didn't throw the rope back in time, the DI just shoved you and in the water you went. So we we learned from that, I suppose, teamwork. Mm -hmm. And then we had telephone poles, and uh, there'd be the whole platoon would line up. And we'd all lay on our backs after we got it up in the air, and you know, that that takes teamwork because mm -hmm. <laughs> it'll crush one guy or even ten guys. That's really heavy stuff. You know, we did that. Eh, teamwork kind of stuff going through basic uh, and yeah. Now, did you at some point kind of figure out what they were doing or why they were doing it, or? <laughs> at first, I thought it was just torture, just mm -hmm. a form of torture. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I maybe ten years later, mm -hmm. I understand what it was all for. Uh, the screaming at you and that is so uh, they give you an order. Charge a damn machine gun, mm -hmm. you don't ask why. Mm -hmm. That's another reason why they wanted young men. Mm -hmm. Somebody 28, 29 say, hey, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I charge that, I'll be dead. You know? Well, the idea was, yes, you'd be dead, but then 10 or 12 other guys would live. You know? And uh, that works best with young guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're stupid. Right. So really, when, when you were going through, you were just trying to survive, and you weren't still right. kind of Basically. stepping back and looking at it and going, oh, that's what's going on. OK. Yeah. So how long does the, the basic training part last? Well, for me, uh, by the time I got in, that was down to eight weeks. Eight weeks yeah. And that's another reason they, they uh, crammed it all. And uh, I think they were really nasty, extra nasty, because they had a shorter amount of town time. Mm -hmm. uh, some, I talked to some Marines that had been through 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, guys that had been in there a couple of years mm -hmm. already, they'd been through 12 weeks of training. And uh, it wasn't quite so condensed. Uh, Right. Now, once you complete your eight weeks, what do they do with you? In my case, uh, I think I went right straight up to uh, driver's training. Okay. Um, yeah, they did have aptitude tests. Uh, I don't know. I think that was maybe in the sixth week. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, the seventh week was when we had rifle training, uh, shooting or mm -hmm. the rifle range. Uh, yeah, we took the aptitude tests, and lo and behold, they chose me to be a driver. Okay. Now, had you driven farm vehicles and things oh, like yeah. that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you I could back up. And, <laughs> you know, uh, when I got to school's battalion, as truck driving school, mm -hmm. pretty near all of them had drove clutches and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I tell you, 
We had one kid that came from New York City. He never drove anything mm -hmm. in his life. And, you know, the clutch, he had no idea what that was for. Heck, <laughs> he had no idea what anything was for. He, uh, he just about drove off the side of the mountain and they run a model truck driving school. <laughs> but uh, truck driving school uh, was two weeks or uh, two weeks of schooling uh, uh, instructions mm -hmm. on tactical driving and stuff like that. And then we had a week of auto mechanics, how it would apply. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we had mechanics, and they took four weeks of, uh, of uh, mechanics. Right. But as drivers, you still had to know something. Yeah, right. And, uh, yeah. Right. And now, did you also do any kind of infantry training? Was this at Camp Pendleton where they did that or yes. somewhere else? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, after truck driving school, uh, I got my 30 days leave mm -hmm. because my orders were for overseas. It right. was Vietnam mm -hmm. specifically. So I got my 30 days leave right after truck driving school. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, coming home, now this is, this was uh, late July, early August of 1966. Mm -hmm. And I come home and uh, boy, oh boy, this also played a part in uh, why I got PTSD later. I come home and I was proud, man. Uh, my grandfather fought in World War I. My father fought in World War II. Keep world free. Mm -hmm. Now it was my turn and I was going to do my best to keep the world free. Mm -hmm. You know, the world free. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was proud, man, and I went around, you know, in my head in the clouds, and people asked me, well, where are you going next? And I'd tell them, ITR for four weeks, and then I'm going to Vietnam. Well. Keep your head low and keep your powder dry, you know. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see any any war stuff. Right. I didn't see none. And I was proud mm -hmm. that I was going to do my part right. to keep the world free. Well, <laughs> that four weeks, that's how the whole four weeks went. And, uh, a lot of my classmates were in college. Well, good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't think nothing of it. And I went back. I went through ITR. That's Infantry Training Regiment. Right. And I learned all the infantry stuff. Okay. Describe a little bit what you're doing in those, in the ITR. ITR, um, well, we had to crawl on our bellies beneath, uh, in, in a dust pit beneath barbed wire with uh, machine guns going off above us. Now, I, by this time, I think this is uh, September 66, first part of September is when this, mm -hmm. by this time, they no longer use live ammunition. And the explanation we heard was somebody panicked and stood up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that sort of did that in. <laughs> but uh, we went through uh, gas training, which was a waste of time, mm -hmm. which, you know. But I, I tell you, some funny things happened during that. And uh, we're waiting in line, and they got this gas house. And the guys, they give them masks, they put masks on, they go in. And then out back, there's a, a tank 
water and they wash the mass off and they put them back in a wheelbarrow and they wheel them out and the next guys go in. And I think there was about, uh, well, uh, a platoon was about 80 guys. So 20 guys would go in at a time. Well, I was in the second group. And so I, I wasn't sure what was happening, you know. And uh, so when my time came, you know, I picked out a good mass and I put it in there, put it on, and the instructor said, make sure it fits good. <laughs> Suck in if, if, and hold your hand over the thing so that uh, it'll suck it in tight to you, and it won't get no gas. Okay. So, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I did. And going through there, and of course, there's always some guys that didn't, you know, and they're gagging, and, you know, and <laughs> I'm a little bit laughing inside my mess, and then, uh, Instructor says, okay, guys, take off your mask and sing the Marine Corps hymn. <laughs> From the halls of... <laughs> gagging, gagging. gagging. Now, now I know what those chunkies were in the mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got out and washed it. <laughs> the next guys get the little chunkies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they had us form up outside so we couldn't go and tell the other guys what was happening. Oh boy, that was that was that was kind of neat. One time uh, we were taught how to cross in, uh, a field, artillery field, and uh, anyhow we're going to cross. My squad is, I think we're about second squad. Now, what the DIs had done is they planted dynamite randomly, and uh, they had loudspeakers, and they'd play rounds of artillery coming in. Mm -hmm. and they make a real whine, and you had, oh, maybe five seconds to take cover. They had these big artillery holes, mm -hmm. you know, where artillery shells right. hit in the pass. Mm -hmm. And uh, you dive in one of them. Well, if you wasn't totally in, and they set off a round of dynamite someplace, uh, you was considered killed, and then somebody had to pick you up and drag your butt the rest away. Well, <laughs> this was kind of neat. You know, running across there, and then they'd play the sound. Everybody dive in a hole, and you'd hear the whine of the shell coming in, and dirt flying up in the air, and you covering yourself. That's kind of neat. Uh, got about three quarters of the way across, and uh, played the artillery shell sound, and uh, guys diving in holes, and uh, we heard this scream coming out of a hole a guy just dived into he dove right on top of a rattlesnake oh <laughs> that sort of ruined that you know i uh, i'm definitely afraid of snakes i'd rather take my chance on artillery mm -hmm. than diving on top of a snake <laughs> that ruined it for everybody nobody well, the Marine Corps goofed up, you know. She hadn't contacted Mother Nature. Right. <laughs> and Mother Nature was using one for a rattlesnake to stay cool. Well, he didn't like the noise, and then he was really pissed off when somebody jumped on him, so he bit him. Mm -hmm. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> All right. Now, do they also have you do uh, marksmanship training when you're up there in ITR? No. Okay, no, you're, you're just shooting so. in, in, in boot camp, but not Just there. boot camp. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did yeah, going through that, going back to boot camp, when I went through that, being a farm boy and being a hunter, mm -hmm. I was really a, 
outstanding shot at uh, <laughs> in here the first time I shot uh, the second day for comparison they mm -hmm. had a shoot you know but it didn't count I shot expert mm -hmm. at great great but you know I must shot a thousand rounds before Friday and my face was swelled mm -hmm. this eye I could barely see out of it and I began jerking the trigger and anticipating that I was going to get whacked. Mm -hmm. I only shot uh, marksmen. Mm -hmm. But there were some guys that uh, didn't even qualify. Mm -hmm. I think we had five guys that didn't qualify. And they, they gave badges to all of us guys that qualified. The non-qualifiers got a little spear on a badge. <laughs> they were called spear chuckers. Well, you know, uh, that wouldn't be politically correct mm -hmm. because uh, we had, uh, I think, four of the five were black guys. Mm -hmm. Nah, you know, you can't do that today. Mm -hmm. nope. <laughs> that was kind of funny, though. <laughs> All right. Now, in, in the ITR, did they have you do any kind of really long marches or that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. We had a 20-mile march. And, uh, yeah, now, they always put the big ones in front, which is stupid to me. You know, put the little guys in front with the littler legs, mm -hmm. you know? Because uh, those big guys, they walk 20 miles. Uh, I was halfway through the line, so I ran about 10 miles. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd run, catch up, and then you'd walk again. And then you'd run, catch up, then you walk again. <laughs> the poor guys in the rear, you know, about five, six, five, seven, they run 20 miles. <laughs> that is terrible, <laughs> terrible. Right. But, uh, yeah, we uh, got there, and that's a long walk. And I don't know, it was hotter than blazes. I think it was over 90, and they had a big barrel of beer, beer cans. And I think it was Coors beer. I'm not sure what kind. But anyhow, I drank one and it made me dizzy. And that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. But fortunately for us, uh, we got to ride on a truck back to base. Mm -hmm. uh, ITR wasn't anything like a boot camp. They didn't get in your face. They didn't scream at mm -hmm. you. As a matter of fact, uh, when I first got there, uh, they called me front and center and I saluted uh, PMI, which is like a drill instructor, mm -hmm. and I said, sir. And he says, hey. He says, I'm an NCO. I'm not a sir. And you don't salute me. You don't call me sir. I said, yes, I mean, no, I mean, okay, correct, sir, or correct, sergeant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess at this point, they regarded you once you were through boot camp. You were a Marine, right? Yes, so, I was a Marine yeah. then. And that's what I come to understand. And then uh, to prepare us for what we were going to see in Vietnam, I, I think about the uh, fourth week, uh, the last exercise we did, uh, we had uh, a whole platoon. And uh, we had this hill. We had a flag on top and the captain up there. And then all the way around it and guys all the way around it. And uh, uh, he'd send out patrols and all this stuff. And then uh, there was 10 guys that got to be Viet Cong. <laughs> had to dress like that, and uh, 
the idea was to infiltrate up as high as they could mm -hmm. and take our flag. Well, anyhow, they never did make it. And I was on the outer perimeter. I don't know why I was a truck driver, but I was out there. And uh, anyhow, I never got sent on any patrols. Some guys did, and uh, uh, they got ambushed and sent out another pr patrol, and they captured some of the Viet Cong. And, uh, <laughs> one of the Viet Cong wouldn't cooperate. <laughs> One of the guys took his rifle and gave him a bash right on the knee. He cooperated. <laughs> it was our uh, PMI. <laughs> Good thing, uh, you know, everybody had all this smudge on their face and he couldn't recognize it. <laughs> he limped around the base the next day, but no, they never got up got all the way up to our uh, thing, and they never attacked the outer perimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, just had an ambush of a squad sent out, and we sent out an a ambush squad, and we got them, too, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, okay. I don't want to back up just a little bit to the truck driving school. What kinds of trucks did you train on? We trained on... Uh, five tons. Mm -hmm. uh, those were short box ones. I don't know, I guess 12 foot or mm -hmm. maybe 10 foot. Mm -hmm. Big trucks. Big trucks. And like I said, uh, uh, that was the third week and that's when that uh, fella from New York washed out. Right. Just as soon as he tried to drive, we had to go way up this hill in Camp Pendleton, and then down the other side. That's like what we did in Vietnam, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, he almost drove uh, uh, the instructor right off the side of a cliff. And the instructor had to whack him and take <laughs> over right there because he just couldn't get the handle of the clutch, mm -hmm. you know, how to operate it. <laughs> How to steer even. Right. Heck, uh, he probably just rode around taxis in sure. New York. Well, or subway that was buses. A, yeah. Yeah, it was the dumbest thing I ever heard of, trying to make him into a truck driver. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, you have, so you, you did truck driving school, you went home, you came back, you did the ITR for four weeks, and then uh, from there they ship you to Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, this uh, last weekend, uh, were shipping out on Monday, and uh, they had a junk on the bunk inspection, just for you know had had to have all your uh, skivvies dyed green. And uh, anyhow, I couldn't get to the washer until the day before, because 80 guys, mm -hmm. come on, you know, in two washers. <laughs> Well, I finally got to it and I washed this stuff and uh, I didn't have time to dry it. I was just minutes ahead of the inspection. So I folded it up, tried to make it look as presentable as possible and put it on the bunk and uh, I'm standing at attention and this doggone captain comes along and he's inspecting, he's inspecting. Looks on the bunk, looks on my bunk again. He looks on the bunk next to me. He sees that mine are darker green. So he grabs them and they're wet. He took a shovel and stirred this shit up. And he said, this is unacceptable. He says, you're confined to the base for the rest of the weekend. I'm going to Vietnam on Monday, mm -hmm. and I'm confined to the base? <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, he took off someplace, and uh, 
uh, there's a sergeant in charge of the barracks. And uh, I think I wasn't the only one. There was a couple of us guys that didn't get them all dried. He did the same thing to all of us. And anyhow, the sergeant uh, says, well, Captain Smith is gone. He won't be back till Monday. So he says, now, uh, I know you guys are confined to the base. And uh, I ain't going to tell you that uh, the window at the far end is open. And I ain't going to tell you that nobody's going to be around to check on you until uh, Sunday afternoon. But uh, I don't want anybody sneaking out now. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked away. Well, you know what that meant. <laughs> out the window and went. And I called home. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to call home mm -hmm. and say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was, that was really cruel, that captain. Mm -hmm. That was really cruel. <laughs> but I guess, anyhow, I did call home and said goodbye. And then Monday, we loaded up on buses. And uh, I'm not sure what airport we left on, but it was civilian. It probably L.A. Because mm -hmm. Camp Pendleton is not that far from L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew to Okinawa and debarked there. And uh, I remember uh, a sergeant coming along and saying, guys, he says, wounded guys in Vietnam really need blood bad. And he says, uh, he says, I'd take it as a great favor if uh, you guys would donate blood, you know. Well, I went right away, but a lot of guys didn't. Mm -hmm. And I said, why, why didn't you? Because I may need the blood tomorrow. I don't want to waste any of it. Mm -hmm. well, I, that's that. And then... Uh, Did they give you any uh, kind of uh, Vietnam training in Okinawa? No. Or did you, you no. Did, that's just a stopover for you? Just stopover. And uh, it was only about two hours. Mm -hmm. And I caught a flight to uh, Chu Lai. That was a military uh, plane. Right. And uh, I believe there was only maybe 15 of us on it, and uh, flew into July, and talking to the guys there, I found out I was the only truck driver. They was all uh, grunts or mm -hmm. infantry. Right. Well, you know, the pilots are joking, of course, but I didn't know that. <laughs> Flying into July, oh, the ground fires light today, we should be able to zoom right in and zoom right out. Well, you know, I'm beginning to get a wee bit nervous here, you know, talking about uh, ground fire. <laughs> but uh, we flew in, and then trucks came, and, and guys loaded up, infantry guys, and went out to their base. Well, pretty soon, I'm there all alone. And then this truck drives up, and the driver yells out, uh, Seventh Motor Transport. Is there anybody here that goes to Seventh Motor Transport? Yes, sir. I mean, yes, Sergeant. <laughs> so, jumped on a swirl of dust. We take off. And uh, got there. And the first thing to do is say, give you all this crap, rifle, canteen, magazines, uh, cartridge belt. Uh, what, what model of rifle were they giving you? Was it still the M14? Yes, okay. I had the M14. As a matter of fact, I had the M14 my whole time that I was there. 
although towards the end of it, uh, when they were getting ready to uh, send them out to the grunts or the infantry, uh, my platoon or my company, B company, mm -hmm. was uh, given uh, M16s and we was to take them out and test fire them, like on a range, mm -hmm. uh, which is one hell of a big rice paddy field mm -hmm. <laughs> with nothing set up, just, you know, shoot at things out there, <laughs> trees, whatever have you. And uh, anyhow, I found out, yeah, I wanted to keep the M14. Because, you know, uh, it was raining on that particular day and everything's kind of muddy. And that M16, it's like shooting a 22, you know. You shoot real fast and then it jam. Mm -hmm. Piece of crap that, that take that M14 and shoot it, it'd get hot but it'd keep right on shooting. You could hear stuff grinding, but it'd keep right on shooting. Mm -hmm. At M16 didn't. All Piece right. of crap. Okay, so it's gonna back up there. So you've, got a, you've, you've arrived, uh, you, you've joined 7th Motor Transport Battalion. All right, uh, and then do they start telling you what you're gonna do, or yeah. how stuff works? Right, as soon as I picked up all my stuff, I had to report to uh, the headquarters, mm -hmm. and they assigned me to A Company, and then I had to report to that, the boss A Company, which I believe was a captain. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. I hated that guy for 20 years. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, now, he's gonna tell me, you know, basically what I'm going to do. And uh, he says, you got hemorrhoids? And I said, no. He says, you'll have them by the time you get out of here. He says, uh, uh, we operate during the day, because during the day, the roads are ours, but at night, they belong to Charlie. You know, and uh, that's basically it. He didn't, he didn't tell me what to do mm -hmm. if this happened or if this happened. And sure enough, you know, um, I went back and I looked at the duty board on the way by. Sure enough, I got to run first thing in the morning, and then I was to go to some artillery outfit, and I believe it was south of uh, Chu Lai. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting up, <laughs> I think I got up 5.30, and you got maybe a half hour to eat and do your Mm -hmm. pre-operation uh, inspection and uh, anyhow I did it and I went out and uh, they assigned uh, uh, a sergeant to go with me, a supply sergeant and I'm making runs back and forth from the docks to the base and uh, boy I don't know Seems like it takes about an hour for, you know, each direction. You know, you could only drive five miles an hour, and and in spots you could go ten. You know. <laughs> Why was it slow? Just because of the, the soil, or because you had to watch out just, for mines, or just I don't know. <laughs> well, running along the rice paddy dikes, they're maybe three or four feet wider than your truck, mm -hmm. see? And that's the problem there. You you ain't gonna go very fast. Mm -hmm. And then there's sharp turns, you come to the end of a dike, you got a 90, 
and that's real sharp. And you have to get around that. There's trees along the edge of some of the dikes, too. And I remember I went like this, and then up a hill. And uh, anyhow, uh, I'd made about six runs, seven runs, and uh, boy, I wasn't sure if I could make another run, so I wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that supply sergeant, you know, he says, well, you, we need to make one more run. We really need this run, and if you don't do it, they're going to have to do it again tomorrow, and uh, you're your CO ain't going to be happy about that. Well, that's easy to talk me into it. Mm -hmm. So I did it. I got back there, and they unloaded me. Well, I don't know. I got maybe a half hour. If everything works perfect, I can get back. Mm -hmm. If everything works perfect, otherwise, I'm not going to make it. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know of any options. So I jumped in my truck and I took off, driving as fast as I could on that little road. I go along tree line, I make that sharp corner, I got part way, oh, just about halfway across that, and here comes the jeep with the officer to the base. Oh, man. Oh. And either he's got to back up a half mile, or I got to back up a half mile. And uh, <laughs> he drives up and he says, pull over and let us by. Well, an officer sits at the right hand of God, mm -hmm. you know, in the Marine Corps. <laughs> so I did. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Dumb, dumb. It almost got me killed. I pulled over and uh, let him by, and then I threw it in reverse, you know. Uh, I got a five-ton truck at that time, and that was the same as I'd trained on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got ten driving wheels, so you ought to be able to go up. But this earth was too soft. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go back. <laughs> it, the wheels just spun. And so I got out of the truck, ran around, and I tried to waved that officer down. Mm -hmm. He was just going around the corner, and he couldn't see me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I waved, and he kept right on going. Well, the only thing to do is get my truck up. So I got back in my truck, and I'm trying to rock it. <laughs> well, it's rocking a little bit, but it just seems to be getting deeper and deeper. And then I hear some rifle fire. And it's way out in the rice paddy. But um, the truck's at such an angle that I'm looking down in the uh, rice paddy. And it looks like stones skipping. That ain't stones. Mm -hmm. I know that ain't stones. <laughs> and so I, I jumped out of my truck with my rifle, my helmet, my flak jacket. And I had everything on then, and I'm steadying my rifle across the uh, front fender. I'm going to kill them before they get me. But my training kicks in. You know, it's maybe 10 minutes before dark now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my training kicks in. I'll get one. I'm sure of that. I'm that good a shot. But there's several out there. And when it gets dark, I've had it. You know, I'm dead. 
So I jumped back in my truck and I'm praying. Now, I wasn't that, that awful religious, but all of a sudden I am. <laughs> and I'm praying, please God, get me out of here. Don't let them kill me. And I'm rocking back and forth. And uh, just all of a sudden, there ain't nothing splashing in the water in front of me. I don't hear no guns. I look out. I have to look up, mm -hmm. and there's nobody out there. Oh, my God. I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> and I tell you, 19-year-olds aren't supposed to cry, especially Marines. You know, we're tough. Mm -hmm. We uh, We chew bullets and we drink napalm. But this Marine was crying pretty bad. He was dead. He was dead. I got out and I crawled underneath my truck and I was, I was crying. At least I'm going to kill somebody before they kill me, you know, because, you know, but then I'm thinking, the things that run through your mind when you know you're dead like that. How am I going to die? Am I going to peek up and catch a bullet between the eyes? Or is somebody going to get close enough that they're just going to whack me side the head with a club with a rifle button and slip my throat? <laughs> Please, God, don't let them get me. Please, please, I'll become a priest. I'll, I'll go to, I'll find you. I'll go to any church. Please, God, don't let them kill me. Well, I'm laying underneath the truck, and the drive shaft's about that high above me because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm scrunched down as low as I can get. And all of a sudden, I hear a noise behind my truck. I try and swing around as fast as I can, but how can you swing around like that? Somehow I made it. Just before, before I pulled the trigger on a pair of legs, I hear it. Uh, guys, there's nobody here, Corporal. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> I almost blew his legs off. Mm -hmm. I almost blew his legs off. And I, I crawled out, I'm here, I'm here. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> well, they came with a camp truck. You know, but they got the groceries and that ship with and uh, they had a chain and they had a whole squad of marines mm -hmm. and they was back behind that uh, uh, behind the tree stand and they heard the shooting mm -hmm. so they stopped and they advanced on foot while the Viet Cong seen them mm -hmm. and saw how many they just disappeared like they always did mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and they come up real slow on my, on my truck, you know. But there was nobody there. Well, there was too mm -hmm. somebody there. Thank God they pulled me out. And uh, boy, I was happy. I was happy. But then I made another stupid mistake, you know. They saved my ass. But uh, the only thing... You know, my mind's going 10 zillion miles an hour. The only thing I could think of, I got to get back to base. I got to mm -hmm. get back to base. Well, driving uh, probably a mile and a half after dark, I did it, mm -hmm. and I made it back. I got to the base. Well, the base gates are shut. Mm -hmm. And the spotlights are flooding the area. Now, you got to remember this is my second day in Vietnam. Yeah. I know nothing about what's happening. And I got back to the base, 
and uh, the guy challenges me, and he asks for the password. I don't even know my name. How in the hell can I remember a password? Well, they ain't going to let me pass. They hold me out there in the floodlights, and they send for somebody from B Company, mm -hmm. has to come down and identify me before I can come in. Now, I just had a pretty close brush with death, mm -hmm. and I'm standing there in the floodlights, and uh, I'm imagining that there's a Viet Cong behind every brush mm -hmm. out there, and he's drawn a bead on my back, you know, because here I am in floodlights. <laughs> how could, how could, you know? Well, anyhow, the sergeant comes down, uh, squad or platoon sergeant, identifies me. They let me in. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got to do my after after uh, post operation mm -hmm. uh, inspection of my truck. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the sergeant says the captain wants to see you. Uh oh, <laughs> and uh, anyhow, I race up there and I report, and uh, he chews my ass out. You know, well, why didn't you just stay there? You know, mm -hmm. why'd you make that run? Why didn't you just come in? Because I, I didn't know I had that option. Well, after your. Uh, after you made that run, why didn't you just stay there and then come in in the morning? Sir, because I didn't know I had that option. Well, you're a dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Now get out of my sight. So I went back to the barracks. Now, this is the second night I'm there. Well, they're shooting uh, uh, flares up all night, which is normal, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. I'm convinced that we're about to be overrun. And so uh, I don't unload my rifle, which is a no-no. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have it unloaded. I have it in my uh, right next to my bunk, my uh, bayonet. And my cartridge belt is right there, all my stuff, and I try and go to sleep. I'm off duty the next day. I try and go to sleep. Well, I didn't go to sleep until about 6 in the morning because I'm so scared. Well, anyhow, the next guy... See, I shared the truck with another mm -hmm. guy. The next guy that goes out, has a run that day, has my truck. Mm -hmm. Okay. He finds that the air tanks hadn't been drained. He finds that it's got a flat tire. No. Yeah, bullets tend to do that mm -hmm. kind of crap. Anyhow, I didn't, you know, this is going to make him late, so he reports it to the uh, squad leader reports it to the platoon sergeant, reports it to the captain. Captain's so frickin' mad, you know, I'd screwed him up the mm -hmm. day before, you know. So he tells the sergeant to get the squad leader to wake me up and make me report. That's bad. That's bad. You don't wake up so some guy that's scared to death like mm -hmm. that. He shakes me. That dumb mistake. I had him by the throat. His eyes were bugging out <laughs> before several other guys grabbed me, you know. And uh, so anyhow, up, up, they marched me up there, and that uh, captain was absolutely livid with me, and, you know. And he says, he says something. You know, the whole thing, everything could have been avoided the night before if mm -hmm. he would have said, 
look, he says, you screwed up big time, mm -hmm. but uh, it's partially my fault. I mm -hmm. should have explained things to you. I ain't going to explain them to you now. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He just told me I was a dumbass and run me out. Well, the next morning they marched me up there and I'm standing in front of them and he's just going off on me like a crazy man. You know, he says I'm a F up and, and uh, but he knows how to handle F ups. And so uh, from now on, I will be riding uh, on a machine gun on every convoy we have. And then if he notices a change in me, he'll give me another chance. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I only went on one convoy, but I, boy, that was a dangerous thing too, you know, sending somebody out that's trigger happy on mm -hmm. a machine gun <laughs> right on top of a truck. That's really dumb. But uh, anyhow, that was pretty close to the end of the month. End of the month, then they uh, had a uh, guard duty for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the first day I got guard duty, I was out in the motor pool and uh, in the middle of the afternoon, and they brought the truck and was drove by the guy that bunked right mm -hmm. next to me. The truck was dead and so was he. You know. Well, <laughs> you know, that uh, that don't make, <laughs> I'm pretty nerved up. Well, anyhow, then I got uh, uh, perimeter duty and, <laughs> and by the end of that month then they sent me on every convoy we had as a machine gun. Mm -hmm. And I met a kid from Muskegon. I never knew his name. Back then, you didn't use names very much because if he got killed, it wouldn't hurt as mm -hmm. bad, you know, <laughs> if you didn't know his name. Uh, I just referred to him, everybody referred to him as Mad Dog. Mm -hmm. Mad Dog, now, this is, this is really interesting too. How he got called Mad Dog, you know? <laughs> Anyhow, we're on a convoy and I'm sitting on a machine gun and he's driving my truck. And uh, anyhow, uh, we stopped just outside the village, and all the villagers come running out. Well, anyhow, they come up near his truck, and he says, you point the machine gun at everybody. Okay, okay, you know, I, no problem with that. You mm -hmm. know, if somebody uh, reach inside their shirt, they're dead. <laughs> we had 50 calibers that make a hole that big, you know. Anyhow, uh, some kids started up close to our truck, and he just howled like a dog and scared the hell out of me, and the kids all took off. Well, I guess they're quite superstitious, and they thought he was crazy or mm -hmm. something, but so did I. I thought he was crazy too, but the kids took off. They weren't around our truck, and I asked them later, about that, he says, look, he says, when I first got here on a convoy, he said, we stopped near a village and a bunch of kids come up to the truck and uh, the truck right behind me, one of the kids had a hand grenade with a pin pulled and he had the spoon wrapped in mm -hmm. tape and he dropped it in the gas tank and then suddenly everybody just drifted away. Well, in about five minutes, boom! Somebody went home as a crispy critter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really know if that's true because I've been to a uh, uh, com couple of uh, uh, B Company reunions. I got transferred to B Company 
and they was talking about all the guys that died in Vietnam, and uh, I think there was only two in A Company and two in B Company uh, for the whole time it was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all four died while I was there, but I don't think anybody got this hand grenade routine. I think he was just trying to, you know, make me aware. I was aware. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned you were transferred from A, so you started with A Company, yeah. and the bad captain is with A Company. Yeah. All right. And, and uh, anyhow, uh, Mad Dog sort of took my, me under his wing, mm -hmm. and I began calming down you know, but uh, with the rotation dates all different. Mm -hmm. He rotated home in uh, December. Mm -hmm. Well, that left me without a mentor. Mm -hmm. Mentor, and uh, I was beginning to get a little crazy again, and. Uh, I never did get to drive the truck so in uh, A Company. And so anyhow, when he left, I went up to uh, platoon sergeant, and he referred me to the captain, and I requested a transfer, which was denied. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Da Nang, and I requested another transfer and uh, I don't know, maybe there was a crazy look in my mm -hmm. eyes or something. They transferred me, give me a transfer. Basically what it was was a trade mm -hmm. with B Company. B Company was getting a new guy in, so they sent him to A Company, mm -hmm. and B Company took me. They, they tried to keep everything so uh, Everybody didn't rotate at one time. Right. There was right. always guys that had been mm -hmm. there. So I got in B Company, and the first thing that lieutenant did was, uh, in my indoctrination, he says, hey, he says, I understand you had a hard time in A Company. Mm -hmm. I says, yes, sir, I did. He says, well, he says, uh, a Company's a real kind of spit and polish kind of company. Yeah, here we are in the middle of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. People are trying to kill your ass and they want you to shine your trucks, huh? Mm -hmm. Stupid. A Company, uh, <laughs> yeah, they actually had guys waxing their trucks. Can you believe that? Oh. I mean, they're supposed to be dirty green for a reason. I don't know, but anyhow, he says, uh, in B Company is different. He says, uh, I don't give a damn how you do your job. As long as you do it and you don't get me in trouble, you know? <laughs> he says, uh, now you know what it's like. He says, in our company, we operate more in the field mm -hmm. than A Company did. You know, we're involved in more operations. We take the guys out into the field and drop them off, and then we run supplies out there. But he says it's not way out in the hills, although sometimes we do that. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we do is uh, we load supplies, and uh, haul them out to helicopters, and the helicopters deliver them mm -hmm. to where the guys are. And he says, you will deliver the guys to the helicopters, and the helicopters take them. Mm -hmm. So he says, uh, you still run into your sniper and stuff like that, but he says, as long as you're alert, 
He says, I've never had my company ambushed, mm -hmm. and I don't expect to. So, okay, okay. And uh, boy, I fit in perfect there. I fit in, and there's some great guys. Yeah. I'll tell you about something that happened about halfway through, though. Uh, anyhow, we had, uh, they, they picked out three guys. Three guys had a run, and we'd go and pick up booze for the officers' club. And they're in pallets. Well, a pallet broke open mm -hmm. accidentally and a couple of cases of rum accidentally found their way onto trucks. On the, the front fender has a ledge that comes out that much on the inside of the hood, mm -hmm. and somehow the booze found their way there. I didn't know nothing about <laughs> it. And uh, so anyhow, the first two trucks went and unloaded and drove out. I was the third truck, and uh, they unloaded me, and they discovered they was two uh, crates shy of rum, Puerto Rican rum, and uh, 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 the supply sergeant or whoever it was, you know, checked my truck and told me to go. Well, just then, the sergeant or the Major, or whoever he was, said, "Hey," he said, "We're missing two, two crates of rum. Stop that damn truck!" And they called up there, and they stopped me. And uh, I showed them my truck. They looked through my truck, and I drove off. Well, that wasn't enough for the major, so he jumped in a jeep, and they tried to pull me over and I think it was in Da Nang, and uh, tried to pull me over. Well, I ain't stopping in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. And he's yelling at me, pulls up side, and I said, follow me back to the base you want to talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was pretty put out. And uh, they tore my truck apart. There wasn't nothing on it. And the other two guys, they had the booze, mm -hmm. and uh, when they got back to the base, they hid the booze, you know, and so they tore all three trucks apart, and with no booze. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I, when I get nervous or scared, I have a tendency to sort of smile, and that's bad. That's really bad. It got me in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. in boot camp, and it got me in trouble with this major. He thought I was pulling one over on him, mm -hmm. and so uh, he was going to, uh, he demanded that our lieutenant hold a summary court martial on me, mm -hmm. so I was confined to the base for a month, supposedly, while they gathered evidence. Well, they couldn't get no evidence. There was no evidence. So anyhow, uh, I drove this uh, sergeant around on the base. I was mm -hmm. confined to the base. And I didn't stop for stop signs. I just did a rolling thing through. And he got mad and said, you know, and I said, hey, what the hell do you think I got a yo-yo here? I can't just come up and stop. I can't get it started again. Well, anyhow, me and him didn't get along. And uh, uh, he complained to the lieutenant. And the lieutenant called that major and asked him if he'd come up with any evidence or mm -hmm. anything. And he said, no. He says, I guess we're going to have to let him go. So uh, they booted me out, and uh, the, that guy that had transferred to drive my truck, they took him off my truck and sent me right back to the truck mm -hmm. and let this guy drive that sergeant around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so 
any of these. Then, uh, let me see, in, in Fubai, in Fubai, I think in September, uh, intelligence had got that there was a division in North Vietnamese someplace in I Corps mm -hmm. uh, up west of uh, Way, mm -hmm. but they didn't know exactly where, and it was getting late in the season, and they didn't want to do an operation or something because the monsoon was mm -hmm. about to start or something. But anyhow, uh, for five days straight, we got about three mortars every night, one o'clock, sometimes two o'clock, sometimes three o'clock, and uh, never knew where they was coming from. You know, by the time they spotted them, you know, three shots, they're long gone. Mm -hmm. They poom, 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 and then they're gone. Well, we couldn't get them, couldn't get them. And uh, the first night, uh, uh, one landed not too far from our bunker. It, it put shrapnel in the side of it, little pieces. It, it must have been 20 yards away, just little shrapnel, then the big stuff. And uh, so anyhow, then the next night, again, but it was further up the hill and round landed in a bunker of clerks. Guys had push pencils, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and I had nightmares of this later, but then uh, that next day we spent filling sandbags again and we put tops on every one, mm -hmm. every bunker. So were the bunkers not covered or just had? No, at first. Okay. They're great big square things. And mortar landed right in one in the second night. Mm -hmm. And they covered them. And uh, yeah. Okay. Now when you were um, out driving either on it, with the convoys early when you had the machine gun or later on just driving trucks, uh, did you run into enemy beyond the occasional sniper? No. Okay. Just the occasional sniper. Uh, Charlie Company, uh, when I was down in Chulai yet, that was when I was first there, mm -hmm. uh, November, uh, during the monsoon, I had to make a run out to Charlie Company, and they was on a peninsula, and the only way to get out there at that time was uh, uh, you drove and they loaded you up onto a, a raft mm -hmm. and they rafted you across. Mm -hmm. And uh, one truck at a time, it was small. And that's all I did is at that day was bringing mm -hmm. out a thing. And by this time, I was pretty smart and I realized, you know, I couldn't get back because the last. The last uh, ferry across was four o'clock, and I couldn't make it before four o'clock. It was 3.30 already. So then I stayed out there, and the correct procedure was uh, I call back to Seventh Motors and tell them that I'm staying the night out there. Mm -hmm. If I wouldn't have known that a couple months before, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I stayed out there and going up there, I uh, had to make a real sharp turn. And uh, the snipers I run into were mostly farmers. Mm -hmm. And I would have been more in danger if they were through a pitchfork at me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they couldn't hit the broadside of the barn. And uh, had one bullet bounce off from my truck and boy that makes quite a loud mm -hmm. clang. I don't know what they were using. It wasn't 
armor piercing or nothing like that because the, the bed on a truck is about an eighth inch mm -hmm. steel and it just put a big dent in it but it just bounced away and uh, yeah that was that was about that and that and then the first night I think those are about the only two really where I knew they were shooting at me mm -hmm. you know I mean I heard other shots but nothing ever even close enough so I thought they were shooting at me yeah. you know okay. now um, when you're off duty or you're on the base how do you spend your time <laughs> hmm. Boy, I don't, I don't even remember. Although, uh, yeah, I do. Sometimes uh, the guys that were off duty, we erected a basketball hoop, mm -hmm. and we had a basketball. Because I've got pictures of myself uh, shooting hoops mm -hmm. in my uh, uh, Bermuda shorts. Marine Corps Bermuda shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, Do they provide any kind of entertainment for you? Did you ever get USO going through or, you know, well, bands yeah, or things? Well, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, nights on base uh, we'd have movies. Mm -hmm. I watched the Sands of Ima Jima. Uh. <laughs> Did they make you watch the John Wayne Green Berets movie? Uh, no. Good. See, that didn't come out until after I was back. That come out very late in 67. 67. Okay. And I saw it, I think, I saw it when I first got out or that mm -hmm. summer or something. Okay. I know I saw it, but I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't care for it <laughs> but uh, yeah well would they I mean could you get beer on the base did you have a enlisted men's club or anything like that yeah uh, we had an enlisted men's club uh, down at July but uh, for some reason uh, we couldn't go to it I don't know why but we couldn't go to it, and uh, I do remember sneaking off base, off uh, Seventh Motors, and going to it. Uh, but uh, uh, you'd have to trade with some guy that didn't drink. Mm -hmm. You know, a pack of cigarettes for uh, one little coupon for a beer. Mm -hmm. That's what you got. One beer. I guess they didn't want us drunk, but uh, still, overall, guys would save up. I do remember once uh, I had enough for six beers, and uh, boy, six beers don't sound like much, but I was feeling not very much pain. <laughs> it was six beers. Yeah, went back to my base. Okay. Uh, in this period of time, I mean, were there people on the base uh, smoking marijuana or things like that that you ever noticed? No, not until uh, I got up to uh, Shucks. I, I think it was uh, Denain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I talked to a guy, and he said, Hey, he says, you want some marijuana? Mm. It's stupid. I said, yeah. He said, well, he says, the only way you're going to get it is this. you get a coupon for uh, uh, a carton of cigarettes. You're allowed uh, two cartons every month, so you get a coupon for two cartons, and you get two cartons. And then uh, uh, the barber on base, you know, you wink at him, 
and you hand him two curtains of sail. And next day, he'll come back with one curtain of sail, and he'll give them to you. He says, they're all undone, and they're restuffed with marijuana. Mm -hmm. So you got a filter and everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I ever smoked. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever carried through with it. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm telling you, it could have been. I don't know personally of any guys in B Company that did it either, mm -hmm. okay. or A Company. Right. Yeah, because there's sort of lots of stereotypes about what happened yeah. in Vietnam. So everyone's yeah. using drugs, and they're all doing this and that yeah. other thing, and so forth. And as far as anything, I mean, I heard this stuff afterwards right. too. And uh, I'm in I'm in a PTSD group with uh, a lot of infantry guys and helicopter guys. And they said, <laughs> I don't know where on earth this came from. But uh, you're wandering around in the bush. Are you going to be high? Mm -hmm. You've got to be out of your damn mind yeah. if you're going to be high, because you're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just that quick. No, you, you, something moves, you shoot it. <laughs> right. Now, another issue that sort of comes up with some of this, particularly about rear area places, would have to do with questions of race. I mean, you have white guys, black guys in the same unit. Were there well, tensions or not? Yeah, now, this happened, this happened, I think, after I'd moved to Fubai. Mm -hmm. All of B Company moved to Fubai. Mm -hmm. A Company was in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin Luther King had just been killed. Okay, that's 68 when that happened. Is it? Yeah. Okay, then it must have been the race riots yeah. in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's 67, yeah. Okay. Anyhow, this happened. Now, one of my best friends was a black guy, mm -hmm. and uh, his name was Corporal Peterson. And uh, I used to sit and eat lunch with him because we both drove the same day, and we mm -hmm. both got the same days off. Mm -hmm. So... Anyhow, this race riots had happened in Detroit, and I wasn't paying no attention, and uh, I saw Corporal Peterson over there, so I took my lunch tray, and I sat right down by him. And uh, one of the guys across the table said, Hey, white boy, what are you doing sitting at this table? Can't you see we're all black? <laughs> Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't know this is for black only. And Peterson says, hey, cut him some slack. This, this guy's a real nice guy, you know. Uh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I got up and I went over to another table where there was all white. I didn't know there was race riots. Mm -hmm. I didn't know nothing. And then uh, at night, Corporal Peterson come up to me and he says, hey, he says, Dick, uh, or no, R.A. Mm -hmm. Everybody called me R.A. Nobody called me Dick. He says, R.A. He says, uh, there's race riots in Detroit, and uh, the whites and the blacks are fighting and all this stuff. He says, hell, he says, uh, I got a brother, I got a, a letter from my brother uh, saying that uh, we don't see anything like tanks, they see tanks in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I thought, what? You know, I had no idea. <laughs> you know, and uh, but that only lasted for about a week. Mm -hmm. 
and then Peterson and I, you know, everybody was spread out, mm -hmm. and I was sent by Peterson again. <laughs> uh, that was, that was, uh, I mean, I'd never seen black people until I got in the Marines. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw them on TV, I saw them playing basketball, I saw them interviewed. Yeah. Football but players. They tended not to have them in Rockford. No, no. Black people were like me, especially going through boot camp. Mm -hmm. We were all interested in the same right. things wine, women, and <laughs> sex. You know, that was it. <laughs> we weren't interested in anything else. All right. But How much uh, contact did you have with the Vietnamese population while you're there? I mean, you're driving through areas that have people yeah. in them. And well, I, uh, you know, I couldn't tell a good guy from a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had them come on to our base, and they seemed like nice people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I stayed away. I stayed away because I'd heard so many stories about a barber mm -hmm. leading a big on through the fence out right. at the artillery hill. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it really happened, but I was told that uh, he stayed in the wire, and that's where they found him the mm -hmm. next morning. It was their damn barber. Well, you know, our barber, we had a barber on our base, and up until I heard that story, he shaved my throat, Mm -hmm. He did a real good job, cut my hair after that, and then he'd do this and mm -hmm. snap and crack it going and then go the mm -hmm. other way and snap. After I heard this, I did my own shaving. <laughs> Didn't matter how much extra time it took. and. Uh, no, he didn't snap my neck no more. Mm -hmm. Now, on the bases, did you have things like like hot water or and and meals in a mess hall and things like that? Yeah, we had a mess hall, a field mess hall. Um, uh, we were most time on smaller bases. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like Chu Lai or no Da Nang mm -hmm. had a real big air base on yeah. it. Stuff like that, but uh, each outfit was positioned out so that they protected the main base. Mm -hmm. And our outfit had our own mess hall, mm -hmm. and we had our own patrols and all this mm -hmm. crap. And uh, uh, yeah, we had our own mess halls and, and uh, had our own uh, supply. Uh, what was that uh, besides the mess hall that you asked? Plus, uh, about hot water for shaving, for instance. Oh, yeah. Do you get hot water? Hot you shave water. cold water? Or? Hot water. No, uh, we didn't have hot water, but we did have solar heat water. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things we did when we got uh, to Fubai, I hadn't made the one in Chu Lai because that base had been established mm -hmm. in the spring, and I didn't come till the fall. But I was there when we established the base in Fubai, and after we got all the tents erected, and then uh, we got pallets from the ammo dump, put pallets down all over, and then we got plywood, and we put plywood nailing ever so often. Mm -hmm down on top of the pallets so we was off the ground right. and then we set up our cots <laughs> and uh, and we made a outhouse I was quite a carpenter you know in my younger days mm -hmm. so I had a lot of ideas and I helped and we had one of the only four holders in all of South Vietnam, we had four holes. 
<laughs> and they took barrels and they cut them in half. Mm -hmm. Well, not half. They were about that tall. Mm -hmm. and then you put that much fuel oil in it, and then uh, I think I think you had to burn them every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then we build our showers too. Now what we did was uh, uh, we used four big 55-gallon drums, cleaned them out real good, and then put water in them. And then you had a spigot with a valve that you could pull a string, sort of like what you see on mash. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think they were about the same thing as what you see mm -hmm. on that uh, TV show, MASH. Right. And you just pull it and water come down. And during the summer season, it got hot. Mm -hmm. You got some pretty hot water. In the winter, it was about 70 mm -hmm. degrees and sometimes lower than that. <laughs> so you did it real fast. And the way you did is, Got wet, let it up, soap up, <laughs> wash it off, let it up, get out. Right. That's how it worked. Okay. Now, how much communication did you have with people back home while you were over there? Well, we wrote letters mm -hmm. back and forth. Uh, at that time, uh, when we happened to be in uh, Da Nang, I was up there for... I don't know, maybe a month. But anyhow, they had what they called a Mars station. And so I got a chance to, uh, on my day off, let me go in town, and I got a chance to call my folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they did it is, I believe it went short wave back to LA and then a ham operator got a hold of a ham operator in Michigan mm -hmm. who called me mm -hmm. or called your, your, my yeah. folks and then they'd answer and I'd talk and then I'd have to say over and then they'd push it, push it, push, push and then my folks would hear it and then they'd They'd talk, and then they'd say over all the way back. It was quite a deal. <laughs> but I only got to do it once. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, all we talked about was 4-H, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my sister showing a cow in 4-H. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, it was no meaty conversations, right. yeah. nothing. Uh, and I didn't say nothing about what was happening to me. As a matter of fact, I never told them what was happening to me except uh, one letter. I was real down, and I, I told my dad part of what happened that first mm -hmm. day. And I said, I don't think I'm going to make it. And that's, and that was stupid because they had plenty to worry about mm -hmm. in the first place. And pretty soon I realized that. And I never said anything about uh, bullets or mortars or anything. Right. And really, that might have helped them, but it worked the opposite on me. Mm -hmm. I needed an outlet, right? you know, but I didn't. And, you know, I paid for it later in life. Right. Now, did you uh, ever get a chance to go on R&R? &R? Yeah, I did. Uh, but that wasn't until like August of 67. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> and, uh, I tell you, I went to Yokohama, Japan, and uh, boy, oh boy, that's quite a story, you know, because I'd been told about prostitutes, mm -hmm. but you got to remember, 
I knew nothing about prostitutes. And uh, all these Marines talking, all this trash, you know. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'm going to find one of those working girls. So he told me where to find them. The guy just got back from R&R &R in uh, Yokohama. So I went to Yokohama. And uh, first thing I did is I was going to go look up one of these working girls. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, I, I did, but there was no working girls. There was a couple of real nice looking girls up at the bar drinking, and I sat down all by myself, you know. There was no working girl. Well, pretty soon, one of those real nice girls got up, and uh, she come over and s says, buy me a drink, soldier, or Marine. Mm -hmm. I think she called me Marine. I said, yeah, have a seat. And, uh, we got our drinks, and I'm about to take a swig on my beer, and she grabs her drink with her right hand and drops her left hand on my crotch. Careful with your microphone there. Yeah, I just about, I just about choked. Well, anyhow, uh, yeah, it, yeah cost me two hundred dollars and then it cost me another hundred and everybody laughed like hell at me after I got back boy she caught, saw me coming mm -hmm. what she did was uh, she had a motel or hotel room hotels because everything mm -hmm. over there is so tiny and uh, anyhow uh, she took me up she promised me all the booze I could drink, all the sex I could take. And she promised me she would get me back on the plane. She'd throw my drunk ass back mm -hmm. on the plane to fly back. Well, at this point, I had another month to go. And I didn't think I'd get killed, but <laughs> anyhow, there's no rules. <laughs> So anyhow, then I got back to Vietnam. And so she got you back to the plane in the Yeah. End. All right. Mm -hmm. Flew my butt back to Vietnam. I went back to my company in uh, Phu Bai. And uh, that was when we started getting hit with mortars mm -hmm. in the night. And like I said, there was three of them. And uh, intelligence had told us that there was a right. division in the. They didn't think we'd be hit, but just in case, you know, uh, we set up all these uh, bunkers and machine guns and stuff like that, and mines out around the base, and all this stuff. But like I said, they'd drop about two or three. Mm -hmm. and the word was we were informed. If you got two short blasts, that meant mortar attack, and you had to scramble in your mortars or in your bunkers. Mm -hmm. And then if you heard one blast, one big long blast, that means they're coming through the fence mm -hmm. and you had to stop them, otherwise your butt would go home in a in an mm -hmm. aluminum coffin. So, <laughs> anyhow, by towards the end, we were so wound up, you know, uh, this is really harassment, dropping one, two, three mm -hmm. of them, and they're gone. Right. And you don't get them, and it don't stop, and uh, you're just waiting for that long blast. And towards the end of uh, the week, we was ready to accept it. Mm -hmm. You let them come, get the damn thing over with, and, uh, you know, <laughs> then if we survive, mm -hmm. we survive and can get back to normal. But 
it never did come. But uh, yeah, three months later after I'd left, it did come. Mm -hmm. But fortunately for me, I was back in the States. Okay. Now when you're driving the men back and forth, you know, the helicopters and all this kind of stuff, uh, were you also ever bringing back I mean, wounded men, casualties, taking them into hospitals, or did other people do that? Uh, some of our outfit did. I never had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you, it was good because uh, <laughs> it messed those guys up, too. Uh, most of the guys, the severely wounded, were hell of a right. Oh, and these mm -hmm. guys uh, weren't that severely wounded. But, you know, there's blood all over them and stuff like that. You didn't want to think of those things, you know. You just didn't want to think. Okay. And then uh, uh, the last week I was there, uh, they had a convoy going to uh, Quezon, and uh, I did that convoy. I, <laughs> a lot of guys, you know, towards the end of their uh, uh, tour, just before they rotated, they wanted to get out of everything they could, you know. But I did, and uh, I remember we went up Highway 1. Uh, and then we cut across on Highway 9, mm -hmm. and uh, gosh, I don't know how far, probably halfway, just before we hit the hills and the big mountains or whatever they want to call them, I think they're hills, uh, they stopped our convoy. And they said, there's an ambush up ahead. and. Uh, so you guys are going to park right here and spend the night here. And so uh, we went out all the way around it, and we dug foxholes. And uh, some guys had to man the machine guns on top of trucks all night. Well, I got one of the foxholes. I had to dig foxholes. And uh, way out on the perimeter, and uh, I remember uh, uh, being scared. <laughs> I'm not infantry, mm -hmm. I don't. But uh, I remember being out there, digging the foxhole and being in the foxhole overnight and watching the perimeter, and uh, they had flares that they shot up every now and then. And I remember I had to pee so bad, I peed right in a foxhole. Because uh, I knew, as scared as I was, every truck driver was scared. Mm -hmm. And if I stuck my head up, somebody would blow it off, you know. So I got on my knees and peed right there. <laughs> and then the next day, we, uh, the ambush had been interrupted and uh, I don't know when there was, I don't know, 18 or 20 B.C. or North Vietnamese mm -hmm. or whoever killed and they stacked them beside the road like cordwood. And I drove through there and I think that was to show, you know, hey you guys, we saved your ass, this mm -hmm. is what we found. You know? I drove through there and I tried counting them, you know, it's sick, sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, got up to Quezon and we had to spend a night there too because there was quite a bit of activity mm -hmm. in the area. And so we ran out the next day and uh, if I remember right, we had an Antos leading the convoy. Can you describe an Antos for someone who doesn't know what yeah, it is? Yeah, an Antos is uh, like a tank except the, the turret doesn't swivel 
and it has got, uh, I think, six 105 Hausers on it. Or recoilless rifles? Uh, no, they're they're big. Well, a howitzer shoots up for direct bombardment, and a, and a recoilless rifle is a big, long gun, but still 100, 500, 6 millimeter bore. Oh, okay. So it's a big gun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. And but anyhow, uh, yeah. We come out of there the next day, all the way back, my base. And then a week later, I took a flight out of uh, Fubai on one of those, uh, I don't know, C-47s or something. Or maybe C-130s or I even mean, a big yeah. big plane. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, they flew me down to uh, Da Nang. And that flight was exciting too because I'd made it, I mm -hmm. made it, I made it, and then we got over the mountains in Da Nang and they hit a downdraft and that damn plane dropped a hundred <laughs> yards. I mean, holy mackerel, I made it, now I'm gonna be dead on it. No, made it. <laughs> we pulled up and landed in the air base. I got on a plane or chat, TWA maybe, I'm Possibly. not sure, great big one, mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of uh, soldiers and uh, nobody hardly said anything on the way back. Mm -hmm. I believe first thing we stopped in Japan and then it must have been windy as hell or something, because then we stopped in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then we flew down to, uh, boy, I'm not so sure if it was San Francisco or... Seattle is usually where they went, if they went that northern route. Where's Edwards? Edwards, that, that's going to be down toward, that's California. Oh, okay. Okay. I think we went there. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Coming out of there, you know, the war, <laughs> you know, I'd heard about it over there, but I didn't really believe it, you know. Damn, I was a hero. I'm not a criminal, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> you know, I come back and that's what I was. You know, I. <laughs> I couldn't have talked about this a few years ago. It's still kind of emotional. It's really hard, but uh, I come back and went through the base and they told us, uh, hey, you guys, uh, if you can afford it, fly civilian, mm -hmm. you know. In civilian clothes. Right. All my money had gone home. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no money. So I uh, put on my uniform and I flew military standby. Mm -hmm. Now, the rest of this crap didn't really happen, but it happened up here. Okay. And uh, I took off and uh, going through the air base just or the airport, mm -hmm. just trying to find my uh, flight. I swear, men would cross over in front of me and get between me and their wives and children when they walked mm -hmm. by. That's what I had become. It was uh, very hard, very, very hard. And, uh, but I flew into Chicago and it was kind of like that there too. But this is all happening in my head. I don't think it really happened. Or if mm -hmm. it did happen, it wasn't for those reasons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I'm gun shy. And, uh, cause when the guys come back, he extended his tour Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got a 30-day leave while he was from California. And boy, oh boy. 
his friends just rooted on him something awful. And he was told how low a person he was mm -hmm. and all. Anyhow, I thought that was happening to me. It really wasn't, mm -hmm. but I thought it was. When I flew into Grand Rapids, still with my uniform on and all that, I got a taxi. And uh, I give the guy 20 bucks. It was only about $10 mm -hmm. fare to drive me all the way out to my house mm -hmm. in Rockford. And I got out of the, I got out of the, uh, I had a taxi, and I'm carrying my duffel bag, which is, hell, I don't know, 60, 70 pounds. There's a ton of shit in it. And uh, I start up the driveway. Well, my dad's up to the top of the driveway. It's quite emotional. And my ma's, I don't know, she's in the yard someplace, and... Uh, I'm lugging it up, and it makes me look like I'm limping, mm -hmm. you know. And they thought I'd been shot, <laughs> you know. And I remember my dad hollering, Mom, Mom, come quick. Dick's home, and he's been wounded. <laughs> I tell you, I was so happy to see him. We had a serious group hug. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that guys never cried, there was tears running down my face. It was, and then, and then, it's really hard here. We go in the house, my sister's home from college. I think she's a junior at Western Michigan. There's a big peace demonstration in Washington, D.C. As I go in the house, she's coming out. She says, hi, Dick, how are you? And I said, I'm pretty good. She says, well, she says, I got to go now. It's nice seeing you, but I got to go. And I said, where are you going? She says, me and a bunch of my friends are going to the Peace March in Washington, D.C. <laughs> that was really hard. And, uh, you know, anyhow, anyhow. Okay, so now, are you just on leave at this point? Do you have to report yeah. back to the Marines? Yeah. I have to report back. So the leave went pretty good except for that. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned to Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, that's the reason why I was a Lance Corporal, because mm -hmm. I was going to get promoted to Corporal. But then again, uh, they were showing us where everything was on base, and they was doing it half-ass. And uh, here's this, here's that. Yeah. Well, the very next morning, I got to run. And the next morning, Sunday morning. So I don't know on this base. Uh, Protestants and the Catholics go to church on a different day than the uh, call. Turn yourself off there. Sure. There. I'm turn the dink thing off. I'm yeah. sorry I forgot that. Oh, there it is. There you go. Right. All right. So, anyhow, one. They, they hadn't give us, or I hadn't, I didn't feel like I had a good enough indoctrination. And w after what happened to me in Vietnam, anyhow, anyhow, uh, I had to pick up a bunch of women recruits. 
and bring them to church. I brought them to the Jewish church. Oh. Well, that's kind of bad, but that ain't that bad. A uh, platoon sergeant, she knew I was going the wrong way, and uh, these trucks, these cattle trucks, they're mm -hmm. semis, and, and the cattle trucks with everything ripped out, except for a row of seats going down the middle mm -hmm. on each side and then on the sides so you can fit 80 people in. Well, anyhow, uh, that platoon sergeant woman knows I'm going the wrong way, so she keeps pulling that cord. Well, it blows a whistle right back at the driver's head. I wasn't told of nothing like that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the air brakes or uh, something going wrong. So I stopped the truck. Well, they couldn't get out of there. I stopped the truck. I go back and I check the airlines. The airlines are good. Mm -hmm. I go around and check to make sure nothing's dragging, nothing's dragging. I get back in. I go down the road and less than a mile and it happens again. Well, what on earth? So I get out there and I check them again and uh, get back in the truck, go down the road again. And it goes, and uh, this time I'm going around the truck and the platoon sergeant's pounding on the door. So I opened the door, and she just jumped all over me, you know, <laughs> taking them. <laughs> well, anyhow, anyhow, uh, I never have done real well with uh, people jumping in my face, especially women. I don't know, maybe I'm male chauvinist, it's true, but I don't do well. So I told her to get her ass back in there, and I took her, and then, you know, I figured, yeah, that's the wrong church after she had been here, so I drove her to right church. Well, uh, I don't know what the Navy is, but he had uh, a colonel thing on his mm -hmm. shoulder. I I think that's below a captain, but I'm Yeah, not yeah, a sure. commander or something Command. like that. Yeah, the next level. Okay, on. he was a minister. And she got off and she started complaining to him. And uh, he started getting in my ship. Well, you ain't going to do that. I'm too short. I just w didn't pay no attention, got in my damn truck and drove it back. Well, there was shore patrol waiting for me when mm -hmm. I got back. Yeah, up to the officer's office, and uh, he had a whole bunch of promotions he was writing out mm -hmm. for guys that had just come back from Vietnam within a month or mm -hmm. so. And he says, see this, Lance Corporal Brown? I says, yes, sir. I'm standing at attention. He says, this is your promotion to corporal. And that was that. He says, now you know. He says, uh, you just come back from Vietnam, so I'm giving you a break. You ain't going to do no, no breaking of rocks in the hot sun. Mm -hmm. But if this ever happens again, you're going to do the breaking rocks routine. He says, this is costing you $200 a month, or no, $50 mm -hmm. a month, because I got four months mm -hmm. doing left. <laughs> so that's why I was the last corporal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, and later, I went home, and everybody was against the war, and so, you know, I went to college and, you know, being 
21 years old, everybody else is 18, mm -hmm. 19. You know, I sort of stuck out like a sore thumb. But I never said nothing, and I made friends. I tried out mm -hmm. for the baseball team. And this one kid I shared a lab class with, uh, he tried out for the baseball team too. And he said to me, he says, hey, he says, you was in the service, weren't you? I says, yeah, uh-oh. He says, hey, he says, were you in Vietnam? And I says, yeah. And he, I, I, I didn't know what was coming, but, you know, he said, well, he says, that's why I'm going to college. I said, oh? He says, yeah. He says, being in Vietnam is really stupid. He says, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Vietnamese can control the world's supply of rice. I don't even like the shit. I'm not going to go fight over for some damn rice. <laughs> His uh, stupidity, <laughs> I mean, I says, yeah. <laughs> and I let it go and drop mm -hmm. right there because I'd already learned, you know, don't don't say nothing. Mm -hmm. You can't talk to people. They don't understand, you know, what it's all about. And where are you going to school? I went to school at JC. Okay. So Grand Rapids. Yep, yep junior right. college. I spent two years there. And I was seven credit hours shy of getting an associate's mm -hmm. degree. But, uh, see, when I come to JC, uh, the counselors, they figured, well, you know, you're kind of dumb, you know, high school grades. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to require you to take a couple of classes of psychology motivation mm -hmm. kind of crap and then reading i had to take two classes uh remember yeah reading mm -hmm. learn how to read good yeah and pronounce words and understand words and stuff like that so after two years i was seven credit hours shy well i wanted to get on with my life if I could have took them in the summer, I would have did it, mm -hmm. and then gone to work in the fall because there was a lot of jobs mm -hmm. at that time. But uh, the one class I needed was only a springtime class, and the other class I needed was only a fall. That meant I had to throw away another whole year. Mm -hmm to graduate. So I said, no. I went and got a job at the railroad. And uh, yeah, then things went on and you know, I couldn't help myself. It was on the news every night. I couldn't help myself. And uh, I, I mean, even when the election time came, I voted Republican, and several generations of Browns turned over in their grave. You know, uh, vote for the rich people? Well, <laughs> Humphrey had no idea, and then McGovern, McGovern's idea was, we'll just frickin' surrender. Well, that was 72, so yeah. that was, yeah. It's 72, we'll just fucking surrender. Well, what about all the guys that were, you know? Um, you know. So anyhow, I voted Republican. and uh, But then we got the same old crap, mm -hmm. and I'm still watching. I couldn't help myself, it was on news every week. And, uh, about 74 or 75, 
when they pulled out, I saw that on TV, and that, that was terrible, mm -hmm. because uh, it condemned me. The rest of my life, I'd be one of those guys that failed this country, you know? So, anyhow, in about that time, I started getting nightmares real, real bad. And uh, some of them were of real things, but some of them were of real things that almost happened that didn't happen, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, like, for instance, I had, I had a dream, nightmare, really, where on that convoy, just for it come back, and uh, we was uh, driving through there, and then after the ambush, and the next day we're driving through there, I just counted the dead people. I didn't really give a damn <laughs> that they were humans. I just, you know, that. So that made me lower than anything. You know, I was really a low, disgusting person. And, uh, well, before this had happened, when I first got out of the Marines, I went to Florida because I had a cousin who lived down there. And while we was there, we was at a hamburger stand, and we was just having a great time. And this bus or carload of blacks drove by, and uh, they were screaming and hollering. And Putin, the radio is just black. Well, 10 minutes before, that's what I was doing, you know. And this, this kid, he says, uh, you damn niggers, get your ass back on the other side of town. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. uh, I says to him, I said, you stupid bastard. They come back here and kick your ass. Don't expect me to help you. You know, as far as I'm concerned, they can kick your ass. You know, uh, a few months before, I was dependent on black guys, mm -hmm. and they was dependent on me. You know, it was, and and now they're back, and uh, you got to be on your own damn side of town, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, in this dream I had, in 75, I go through there uh, uh, in the ambush, and uh, my assistant driver, for some reason, was a black guy, and his name was Sonny. He was a great big black guy. Anyhow, uh, he caught a round in the face, and it blew half his face away, and I just shoved him over, and then I drove and I got us through. And then in my dream, I revert back to uh, what happened in Florida. Only uh, now, Sonny is one of the black guys, and he's missing half his face because it got blown off. Now, it only got blown off in the dream. Right. Yeah, right, okay. And he's looking at me with this one good eye. I woke up, uh, oh, I was shaking so bad, and uh, I tried to hide everything from my wife. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, you heard a lot of stuff in the paper, and I mean, it always jumped out mm -hmm. right to me about Vietnam vets coming back and going crazy, mm -hmm. taking family just hostages, mm -hmm. blowing everybody away. Well, I, I didn't want to scare the hell out of my wife. I was praying that God would take my worthless life before something like that could possibly happen. 
But anyhow, I'd have those dreams, and I'd get up, and I'd make the way into the bathroom, and I'd sit on a toilet because I had these terrible stomach cramps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd get the diarrhea, and uh, I'd barf, and I learned to pro position my legs out on angles, and then I set my head on my knees, and mm -hmm. my, or on my elbows, and my elbows right on my knees. So if I passed out, I wouldn't fall. And you can always tell when you're going to pass out. My forehead would there'd be a million needles in it, mm -hmm. and I just know I was going to pass out. Well, bang. Sometimes it kept me from pass or falling. Sometimes mm -hmm. it didn't. I don't know. Uh, maybe half conscious. Anyhow, I fall in the floor, and I'm laying in my own puke and shit. <laughs> the wife would hear me, and she'd come tearing in the bathroom and putting damp cloths on my forehead, trying to keep my mouth all the shit so mm -hmm. I didn't drown in it. And I just, I lied like a trooper to her. I told her that I'm really worried about losing my job on the railroad. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they're downsizing, mm -hmm. and I might, you know, what would I do and all this crap, and you know, because it was a real good job. Mm -hmm. Hell, real high paying job. I was a district repairman, a plumber. Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, I, I kept trying to fool her like that. I had that dream and I'd have other dreams. Uh, I'd dream, I'd have a nightmare about that mortar attack mm -hmm. in Fubai. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, uh, in my mind, they blew that one long whistle and they're coming through the fence. Mm -hmm. Well, I man the machine gun in the corner and I'm just mowing them down left and right and we beat them off. Well, the next morning we go out to do a body kill. The corner I was responsible for there wasn't a kid over 10 years old out there. I mean, I killed them all. Boy. <laughs> mm. How long did this go on for you? The nightmares? Yeah. I started, I started getting nightmares at first when I first got back. But they weren't, I mean, Jesus, scary. But and i just go on with mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. The real bad shit didn't happen until after Vietnam fell. Mm -hmm. That was a trigger. And I dreamed that I was going to JC, yeah? and uh, I had a class up at the East Building right after I had a class at the West Building. And uh, you had to walk up there. I think I think there was an hour between classes, so it wasn't real hard for me. I think I had an hour off. But uh, in my dream, I'm going up there, and down the street coming towards me is a peace demonstration. And. My favorite lady, Jane Fonda, is leading it. And, uh, boy, I got to walk right by him. Or they got to walk right by me. I get part way up the hill, and she points at me. And she said, real loud for everybody to hear. There goes one of those killers there. And, uh, course I have to hey I never killed anybody mm -hmm. she says no you just carried the soldiers out in the field 
and carried the artillery shells that killed these little kids and stuff. And I said, hey, I, I didn't do anything. And she says, liar, look at your blood stained, hand, stained hands. And I'd look, and there was blood on them. And I'd, <laughs> it wouldn't come off. <laughs> And I'd go tearing out of there, and and everybody's racing after me, and I lose them. I go in this bathroom, and I'm washing and washing and washing, and it don't come off. And then I'd wake up again in the bathroom with, with my hands like that. Boy, I tell you, that is why I got a 30% disability. Uh, yeah, and I'd tell you. Now how long did you guys, how long did it go on before you got any help or? Well, it, there was help available, but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And it went on till uh, September 21st, 1988. Wow. And I had to go, or I didn't have to, but my brother-in-law you know, because I was still a carpenter. I knew how mm -hmm. to do stuff. Wanted this deck put on his house that he had in Grand Rapids. So I went down there and showed mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Well, I was getting sicker and sicker. And uh, I said, well, I got to go home. Well, I went home. I went to bed. I had a hell of a time falling asleep. But I finally fell asleep like that. I'm in Vietnam. I'm driving a five-ton truck. Here comes a Jeep the other way. <laughs> well, I got off the road. He ordered me to move over. I did. I got stuck. And there's bullets coming at me. They're splashing. And I get out of my truck. And I'm going to shoot them. And then I realize my only chance is to uh, get my truck out, because I'm dead unless I do. I try. It don't work. I notice there's no more shots. So I crawl underneath my truck and I'm waiting to die. And I'm begging God, don't let him get me. Please, God, don't let him kill me. And uh, anyhow, I wake up. And there's a clock right on the side of my bed. And it says September 22nd, 1988. It ain't real. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm hyperventilating. Mm -hmm. I go in the bathroom. I put my own washcloths on my head. And uh, I come down, I crawl back into bed, and I'm underneath my truck again, just that fast. And somebody comes up and I almost blow them away. And uh, anyhow, I, uh, they pull me out, I drive back to my base, and I'm back to the base, and they stop me, can't get in. Sergeant identifies me, and I come in, and then he says, the commanding officer, I gotta go stand in front of him. So I go up there, and he chews my ass. And then I go back to my bunk, 
and the same thing happens over. And the next day, the routine is finished. It's all in my dream. And I choked the guy damn near to death. They march me up from the CO. Commences to get on my ass again. Tell me where I screw up I am. Says I'm gonna be on a on a truck man a machine gun until I learn to uh, not screw up. <laughs> well, I woke up then. I'm on the other side of the house. I'm bashing my head against the bathroom door. My kids are all woke up. <laughs> they're, they're all panicky because their dad mm -hmm. is crazy. Well, then that's when I got help. Mm -hmm. They rushed me to the hospital. They gave me a, my temperature was real, real high. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says I'm having hallucinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of. And it's all caused by my high temperature. So they give me a Instead of a pint of blood, they give me a pint of cool fluid. Mm -hmm. and it does the trick. Calms me right down. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. That's the situation. All we got to do is find out what you must have some kind of flu or something. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to find out what's causing it, and we can treat you for it. Oh, I do all kinds of tests. I can't find nothing. I'm still pretty calm, so they send me home. <laughs> and they told my wife, if it happens again, draw a tub of cold water and make them sit in it. Okay. <laughs> you know, I sat in that tub quite a bit that night, and uh, Next day, I was going to see this doctor and that doctor, see what it was. And uh, anyhow, they, they're doing all kinds of blood tests. Man, mm -hmm. I must give a quart of blood. <laughs> all the blood tests. And they made crap and pee and everything mm -hmm. else, but they couldn't find it. And uh, so they keep sending me to specialists. And finally, I went to this doctor, and he had no clue either. But uh, he was going to do more tests than that. And uh, the nurse was in the room with him. And I started telling him of my nightmares. Mm -hmm. And she interrupted the doctor and says, well, were they all related to Vietnam? And I said, yes, they were. I mean, that's where everything started. Mm -hmm. And she knew what was wrong. She knew what was wrong because her husband was in the first cab mm -hmm. and uh, he got the same thing and he beat the hell out of her until, until they figured out, you know? And so she went in the room with my wife and was, <laughs> Drilling my wife about if I beat her and that mm -hmm. stuff. Never happened. Never happened. I never did anything mm -hmm. like that. But anyhow, uh, next thing I knew, they made an appointment with the VVA mm -hmm. here in Grand Rapids for that afternoon. Mm -hmm. I went right from there to the VVA. And I had a okay. counselor that. Uh, uh, well, the VA or the VB? Because VBA is, VBA. V is Vietnam Veterans of America. Yeah, the VA. Uh, they they weren't no. with the program yet. Okay. They hadn't recognized it, but uh, my counselor uh, was Mike uh, 
uh, shucks, can't remember his name. That was a long time ago. But uh, he had stepped on a landmine and blew his leg off. So he had a mm -hmm. uh, artificial leg and uh, and uh, anyhow, uh, he wanted me to start at the beginning like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And uh, pretty soon, you know, uh, I got to crying and screaming and everything else, and he kept me right on going. But when I get too carried away, he'd take his cane, tap, tap, tap. I saw that. And, uh, thought to myself, he had a leg blown off, mm -hmm. and yet he can talk. Mm -hmm. There's hope for me, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, anyhow, I went through counseling with him every day for a week, and then twice a week for a couple more weeks, and then once a week for a while, mm -hmm. and then I thought, I'm cured. Uh, just so you know, there's no cure. Oh, you can, no you can get it under control. You yes. Can you live can with learn. it. You can learn. You can learn. But I have a tendency, I mean, we all, all Vietnam vets, have a tendency to, to forget about the rational thought process. And, uh, the VA calls it the CPT, co cognitive progressive or mm -hmm. something or yeah. I don't okay. see. Whatever. It's garbage. All it is is the rational thought process. Mm -hmm. You gotta think rational. You gotta every thought you have, you gotta challenge it. Is it rational? Mm -hmm. You know? And then you gotta replace replace your thought with something that was rational and then you'll calm down and it won't be quite so wild but that's that. And uh, anyhow, I thought, hey, I'm cured now, you know? And everything went pretty well for a while, but then they had this stupid desert storm. Mm -hmm. First, it was Desert Shield. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hands, I started getting tingling mm -hmm. in them again. Uh oh! <laughs> It ain't going to happen again. So I called down there and they mm -hmm. said, hey, we're just starting up a group. We'd like you to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came in and I went through a group and we all went through things and, and we watched what was happening and we'd comment on them and everybody, you know, the counselor is always mm -hmm. there. That ain't rational. Mm -hmm. Think of something rational, you know, and uh, it worked out pretty good until Desert Storm, mm -hmm. and it just happened that we was there for Desert Storm, and he was right there mm -hmm. all over us, mm -hmm. you know, to keep it straight, keep it straight. Well, that's fine when I'm there. Mm -hmm. But I got to go home every night, mm -hmm. and uh, they're playing something else on TV about, you know, this or that. And, oh, boy. <laughs> At least it was a short I war. I started backsliding, so then I, you know, I've been in counseling for 20, 24 20, years. Yeah. About, mm -hmm. I'm still going to counsel. Mm -hmm. I have to yeah. because I I learn and you can't just quit because there's always something out there mm -hmm. and if you don't, you know, I try as hard as I can and I'm very successful. I have had a pretty successful life, mm -hmm. you know, but there are still things that push me mm -hmm. and then I'll. I'll backslide, and if I ain't got counseling, I'm mm -hmm. in big trouble, big trouble. Yeah. And so then did you have to deal with sort of the 9-11 and then going into Afghanistan and Iraq? I mean, how's that? <laughs> yeah, those push buttons, those mm -hmm. push buttons. Uh, but like I said, 
I got a counselor down mm -hmm. at the VA, and I call him up and say, gosh, damn, guy, I'm having a lot of trouble. I don't think I can wait until the next meeting mm -hmm. before, you know, I spill my guts and, and cry a little bit and get upset. And you help me out. Yep, mm -hmm. come right down. He'll cancel two, three meetings and slide me right in. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so complaining, something like that, the VA right now is saying, you guys don't need counseling no more. You know, we're going to work with the Afghanistan vets and mm -hmm. the Iraqi vets, and that's fine. But, uh, geez, oh, Pete, you know, don't forgive me. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me, I, you know, I need it. I do need it. Okay, there. Wow. Anything else? You know, I, I'd say you, you're pretty well covered. I mean, it actually is tremendously valuable from, from our, our side for you to be able to lay all of this, this stuff out. Because part of the point of doing these interviews is, is to let people know both what it is like to be in, in the military and to particularly be in a conflict and, yeah. and what kinds of effects that, that has on people yeah. and how that plays out. And you have a lot of people that they just don't know when they don't hear from anybody. They don't really have a clue. And you, you, yeah. you've got it out there. So. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a brave thing to do in itself, but I mean, I think it's one where you've kind of figured out, okay, it gives just, you, helps you too. Just before uh, the war happened in uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. just before they invaded Iraq, I was watching the news and they had a bunch of Marines mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were interviewing them and uh, I can't forget this because this guy was just like I was, you know. And he, he says, oh, he says, I'm in the infantry, and I can't wait to get over there because mm -hmm. I want to know if it's really true. If you shoot a body, if the body will keep jerking at every time you shoot it. And I thought, you dumb son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. You dumb son of a bitch, you're going to find out. And then you're going to be just like me, and how good is that? You know? Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, these guys come back now, they're screwed up. They're screwed up. You know, they're like the Vietnam guys. I mean, some can adjust pretty well, others have real issues, uh, and, and no rhyme or reason to it necessarily either. Well. I was reading in the VFW magazine that uh, some people are more susceptible yeah. than others. And uh, they're in the process of developing tests. Mm -hmm. And if you're susceptible, you ain't going to get in, which is a great idea. You know? As long but, as there's enough people who aren't susceptible. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I don't know. Well. I understand that 50% of Vietnam vets are already dead. I don't think that's actually true, but, I, but, I, I, but I've heard numbers higher than that, so yeah. Yeah, well, I've heard that an awful lot have committed suicide. I don't buy that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know of, I had a friend that yeah. did. Yeah, there are some. I guess what they do know is that the suicide rate for returning vets out of these more recent ones is higher significantly than, yeah, yeah. than average. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's a reminder, I guess, on some level that, that war, war is an ugly business. Oh, yeah, And, and we're better off not being in them uh, as much as possible. Well, you see, uh, my point of view back then, uh, well, the whole country's point of view uh, was uh, uh, the communists mm -hmm. are out to rule the world. If Vietnam fell, uh, who was that uh, famous uh, Secretary of State? It was Dulles, maybe? Yeah. yeah. He said if... if the domino uh, thing, yeah. yeah. Domino effect. Domino theory, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought, boy, it'd be much better we're fighting them in Vietnam than in Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was the thinking at the and time. And that was the thinking. And, uh, you know, and I tell you, 
It was 18 months before I really had anything to do with my family much again, mm -hmm. or the people around Rockford or Grand Rapids or any place. And so much had happened. So much had happened. The views totally were different. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, uh, it seemed like half the people thought we should be there, half of them thought we shouldn't. And of the half that shouldn't, thought that those that went were lower than whale crap on the bottom of the ocean, you know. And uh, today, today uh, they don't blame the soldier right. near as much as the damn government. Well, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that would have worked for Vietnam, too. Well, yeah, it would have really been a lot better yeah, because actually my PTSD, that one event, uh, being trapped under mm -hmm. the truck, right. might have been the major trigger. But coming home and seeing my sister mm -hmm. go there and seeing uh, the way my friends felt and being in college. Mm -hmm. you, you, have, know, you have no outlet. You yeah, can't talk no, to people. No, none. And, and, you know, the way people looked on the soldier, mm -hmm. it, uh, it caused PTSD. It, it caused me big problems, big problems. Uh, well, well, that's it. Yeah, well, thank you very much for coming in and talking yeah. to me today. Right. Okay, thank you. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building on his standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.